Hi, I'm Rob Shore, Director of Product Marketing for Coriant. In this video, what I want to do is take a look at consumer services. If we remember from some of my previous videos, uh, we talked about all the different types of traffic flows in transport networks, but in this video, I want to focus very specifically on the service delivery network, the consumer services network. And there's a couple very prominent myths and misconceptions about traffic in this part of the network with these types of services uh, that often lead people to make bad decisions about how to build their networks and where to put their critical resources. The very first myth I want to take a look at uh, concerns mobile traffic versus wireline traffic and how much traffic is generated by each of these two different access methodologies. Typically when I ask people about mobile traffic and how much of the bandwidth in the network results from mobile access infrastructures, I usually get responses of anywhere from 50 to 80 percent. People believe 80 percent of all the traffic in the network is generated by these mobile networks. Well, let's take a look at that to see if that's true. If we look at the actual consumption by different customers with different types of access methods, uh, what we'll see is a typical mobile customer per month will consume about 84 meg worth of bandwidth. But now if we compare that with how much bandwidth is consumed by the typical wireline customer, the typical wireline customer per month consumes 17 gig worth of traffic. Yes, meg versus gig. Okay? What this shows us is that these fixed line networks are actually responsible for generating more than 200 times the traffic that is generated by these mobile networks. In fact, if we look today, mobile infrastructures are only responsible for generating about 3% of all traffic. And if you actually think about it, it makes sense. If, if I take my phone and I ask you, is this, is this a mobile device? The answer to that question is no, it's not a mobile device, it's a portable device. Right now, when I'm in this building, I'm not connected to a mobile network, I'm connected to the Wi-Fi network. And from a transport network perspective, the Wi-Fi network is actually a fixed line network. On top of that, even when I am connected to the mobile infrastructure, well, what do I do on my phone? Okay, I make some phone calls, I send some text messages, look at a web page, maybe see a YouTube video. But really all the heavy lifting applications, the high bandwidth applications, I really do those from home. Either on my 55 inch LCD TV or if I'm downloading massive files, I usually do those at home. So again, I have a device that's only sometimes connected to the mobile infrastructure, uh, but even when it is, I'm only doing relatively light lifting applications. So it's really, really pretty clear uh, why only a small percentage of the traffic in the network is generated by those mobile infrastructures. And even by the end of 2015, uh, where we'll see a much more predominant uh, deployment of LTE infrastructures, mobile infrastructures will still only be responsible for less than 7%. 93 plus percent of all traffic is generated by these fixed line networks. Uh, and it's not just the way they are today. These fixed line networks are still growing at a, at a pretty impressive 32% uh, year over year growth. So what this tells us, right, if you understand real, where the traffic is really coming from, uh, it can enable us to focus our efforts and energy on the right parts of the network. If you build a network that's optimized around the wire line infrastructure, uh, you'll get the best bang for the buck. And, and really, uh, you can generally, once you build that infrastructure, you can almost throw on uh, this less than 7% of traffic on top of that infrastructure uh, almost for free. So again, it's a situation where understanding exactly where traffic comes from accurately uh, can enable us to focus our efforts and design these networks uh, more optimally and come up with overall better transport solutions. So this is the first one, mobile versus wireline. The second myth I want to dispel here, it's really built into the actual name of these networks. Uh, what most people call these networks is either backhaul or aggregation networks, right? I'm sure you've heard the term mobile backhaul quite a few times. What I want to do is look at that name and first of all see if it's right uh, and then see what impact that has on how we build these networks. So to determine if this is the right name, let's take a look at the way traffic actually flows in the network. And the way we can do that is by looking at the applications that drive bandwidth. So here's a list of all the top 10 applications driving bandwidth in the network. And what we see is really the top five applications here, they're all massively downstream, right? This is video streaming, uh, even web surfing or uh, application downloads. These are all very, very downstream. In fact, you have to go all the way down to number six, BitTorrent, uh, to get to anything that's not downstream. And this is just symmetrical, right? It's not even more upstream than downstream. So what we see is traffic really, while all these applications that are driving bandwidth in the network, uh, traffic is just massively more downstream than upstream. Well, how much? Let's take a look at the actual numbers. Well, we've already seen that the typical wireline subscriber consumes or downloads uh, about 17 gig worth of traffic per month. 
so how much goes upstream? It's actually about 1.5 gig, 1.4 gig. What that means is you have more than 12 to 1 downstream versus upstream. Okay, and that's for the fixed line network. The wireless network isn't quite as uh, dramatic, but again, remember the fixed line is producing 97 plus percent of all traffic. So this is the area that really makes the most difference. So again, what we see is the traffic is really massively more downstream than upstream. And that gets us back to the names of these networks, right? Backhaul aggregation, that's probably not the best name for these networks. Maybe a better name for these networks would be distribution network, okay? Now, okay, that's interesting. These are clearly more distribution than aggregation, but that's just a name, right? Does it really matter what we call these? Well, let's take a look at why exactly it does matter, because it can lead us to make bad decisions about our network. If we think of these as aggregation networks, what that's going to cause us to do is put a lot of emphasis and spend a lot of money here at the edge of the network. It's going to cause us to buy very intelligent devices, deploy them at the edge, where of course I have the most number of locations, and I'm going to do that in an aggregation network because I want to take the traffic to the edge here and I want to squeeze it as much as I can, filter out as much as I can, so I'm sending as little information upstream as possible then all these upstream devices, all they are going to be doing is steering traffic. I don't really need intelligent devices as the traffic goes upstream. So this is what I would do in an aggregation network. But if we understand the traffic is really distribution network, right, it's really more distribution direction, in this type of network, what I'm going to do is spend my time, energy, and money here at the core of the network. This is where I want my expensive intelligent devices. Because, yeah, I'm going to have requests from the users that are going upstream, but it's that device in the center of the network that's going to determine exactly who gets what content, who gets which streaming video, who gets which web page. And once this device has made that decision and sent that traffic out, all the rest of these devices, all they're going to do is distribute that traffic. I don't really need particularly intelligent devices in the downstream path of this network. Right? Yeah, I'm going to want granularity, right? I'm going to probably want some type of packet visibility, but I certainly don't need routing intelligence or any kind of traffic subscriber management uh, capabilities in those devices. And so this is the idea. If I think of the network the right way, it can enable me to, to change where I'm putting my resources, to make better decisions about how I'm structuring the my network, where I'm putting different critical resources, and where I'm spending most of my money. So that brings us to the end of the session, uh, hopefully dispelling these two uh, prominent myths about uh, traffic flow in these, in these parts of the network uh, will help you make better decisions about how to build your network, what kinds of solutions to select, and where to put your critical resources. Uh, if you want more information on some of Corient's solutions for these different types of uh, networks, please visit us at Corient.com. And I hope you found this session interesting, and thank you for watching.